Totally, and I, I totally agree with that, Patrick. And I think the the stories can be so powerful because it can resonate with other people, and you can see similarities w- within yourself. So that that's really helpful. Thanks, Patrick. Darren. Yeah, thanks, Patrick, for that. It was really interesting because again, we've seen elements of that where we are within East Ryde and Yorkshire Council. Obviously, vast, vast, vast area. Um, the pandemic causes a huge problem in that staff were now agile working. So you know they're as high as Bridlington, um, they're as down as as low as Goul and Poppington, etc. If you do know the area at all. Um, but the performance side of things is something that we are looking at. Um, obviously, the, the corporate goals are your attendance at work, which tends to be a long a longer term goal that you're looking at, and we're looking at ways of reporting back into that as well. Um, but some of the services that we're doing, we're utilising health champions that we've got, for example. So we're trying to obtain some feedback from that, um, identifying different trends. And we, we tend to use as well, we've got a campaigns calendar that we tend to use throughout the year. Um, and what we do is things such as um, stress management toolkits. So particularly if it's a stress awareness month or there's something around a particular campaign. What we try to do is get people involved with it. So try and involve the staff with it and then get some testimonials and feedback from that as well. Um, so that's obtaining some shorter goals as well. We do some we do some physical screening. So we use one of our partners that we've got within the leisure services that actually does a body composition. Um, and what we call we call this a staff MOT. Um, and we're just reviewing it actually where we need to sit it within the, the employee journey. So we're looking at everything from induction processes right through to retirement and then the gaps in between. Um, but that particular provider gives us a reporting tool. So we're getting individual reports back on data and we're doing repeat consultations with them. So we're starting to see physical health and how that's changing. So, again, that's some of your shorter term goals. Um, we also use the farm outcomes platform. Um, so when we're carrying out things like NHS health checks and doing blood pressure checks. Um, so we get a monthly report back from the farm outcomes platform that actually gives us a raw data. Um, and again, we can compare that back to a particular campaign that we're doing or a particular venue that we've worked with, be it a children's centre or a library or a depot. Um, so again, you tend to work quite segmented, but eventually the pieces will all come together. Um, and it's just pulling that service evaluation back because each one we found as well is very different. The depot feel is very different to a library, to a children's centre and back into a school. Um, but one thing we are looking at is the net promoter score as well. So we're looking at a QR code based survey um, where where staff have inter- had an intervention, whether it's through our internet pages or done a consultation or they've, you know, they've had a one to one with somebody. Um, we're going to ask them to complete this net promoter score that also has a well-being questionnaire behind it as well. Um, and then keep that going as a, as a promoter. So we can do that locally for different um, service areas, but then also corporately we can open that back up. Um, because the organisation does operate with a performance wheel, actually similar to the wheel that you showed there in your, your presentation, Nadal. Um, and we're looking at that as well around all kinds of, um, you know, KPIs and, and achievements that we want to get. So I think my advice and something that we found really well is work it in smaller pieces. Um, some feedback processes and, and evidence gathering will differ from the people that you're working with, uh, particularly from those that are networked or non-networked, as an example. Um, so it's about finding the right the right mechanism, the right tool that works for you. But the campaigns work particularly well because you can almost have a, a rolling monthly assessment um, because those people will engage in, in things that are interesting to them. So if it's National Heart Month, for example, people will get involved with it. If it's diabetes prevention, they will come forward. Men's Health Week is always a massive one for us and it's always a really successful week. Um, because suddenly the men feel it's OK to engage with a wellbeing service, whereas for the other 50 plus weeks of the year, they're not interested. Um, but then we capture that data and they can work with it. So, yeah, there's there's pros and cons to small and then the larger goals as well. But um, that's some of the practices that we're we're using and looking to use as well. Thanks, Darren. That's really helpful. I just thought as well about the um, the different sort of topic areas like diabetes that you just said. Um, and people, people who who have who it's relevant for attend these, and it was something that I'm trying to focus on as well, trying to encourage people to attend because it links in with the diversity element of things as well. 
trying to attend things that are not relevant to you particularly. So an easy example would be if it's women's health, something to do with menopause, but actually men should be like men should attend menopause too so that they understand what it's like. And there's so many different examples of that, but that's an area that I've been also looking at trying to um, work on because, yeah, you like you said, you get attendance with people who are um, it, it's relevant to. Thanks, Lauren. Thank you. I mean, we, we plan to have, uh, you know, an, an open discussion, which I think we've already start, started doing, really. So it's if anyone's got any other sort of comments or things they want to share or equally challenges that you'd like support with as well. I think this is what this forum is for, so we can help each other. I always like to give that gentle pause so people can <laughs> take the time to put their hands up. But I think I've, I just put in the chat. So one of the I wouldn't say challenges at Essex, but we are just we're quite in the early stages of looking at our e EGI strategy. So there's been a lot of kind of ad hoc work over the last couple of years. Um, and just now we're uh, recruiting. We've got a new lead starting in May. Um, but I just put in the chat. It's around how do we connect their strategy and framework with our strategy and frameworks. I think there's a lot of connections there. And there's certainly, if we look at the demographics within our organisation, individual who we're not reaching, reaching as much as we might do others. Um, and even just thinking about for us, and I'm sure it's the same in many councils, that the majority of our workforce are female. So uh, around 75% identify as female. Um, but I think sometimes that means we end up missing some of the support that might be able to be put in place for, uh, for those who identify as males and it's it's then how do we engage them exactly as Darren said that you might get that engagement during that men's health week but then it drops off after that um, and we're at the minute starting to look at how can we develop that even to the sense that we we have a women's network we don't have a men's network and and there's been quite controversial discussions around that so um, and I'm sure others have had similar challenges I don't know if other people have kind of started to look at the links between their wellbeing frameworks and areas like EDI. Again, pausing for any hands. Sabrina, I'll come in briefly again, if you don't mind, I can do yeah, that. Of course. Um, so yeah, again, I mentioned about the new HR lead um, who came in and it was, it was refreshing to see that she'd come across with a very much wellbeing hat on. Um, and East Riding has had a culture for years, as many of other councils have, that, you know, it's trying to break down them cultures. Um, but what she did really well was actually she she created what we're calling a people strategy. So it's almost a further layer that sits above all the other strategies that are already happening. Um, and he talked there about bringing them together and how we can merge that together. So we we've actually we're in the process as well of regenerating our internet page. We're actually EDI. Um, agile transformation, training, well-being, everything actually going to be encompassed in one place um, because we've got vast internet and the feedback has always been that staff struggle to find information. They don't know what there is relevant to them, how to find it, what to use. Um, so, yeah, I guess my point is we created a people strategy that was pumped straight out of HR um, and people services. And they said, right, within this strategy, we're now going to work towards these smaller sections, things like a better health at work recognizing the menopause for example as a, as a local um, example um looking at the pay and reward scheme as well making sure that we're up to date with that so there's there's big sort of assessments and um overviews of that going on but yeah i guess the umbrella has really helped because people can see now we're trying to put it under one strategy and they can get an identification of what what that will entail as well yeah thank you that's really helpful and i think it's interesting because uh, we're the same we have kind of a people plan and part of that is a healthy place to work but I think for me it's then how the challenge then is how do you bring all of those things together and ensure they stay together and I think our HR team have been working on that internally and they're setting up kind of program boards for each of our streams of our people plan uh, because I think in their previous iteration of the people plan it didn't all come together you kind of had different areas working in silos so they're trying to kind of adapt and ensure that they can change in response to some of the challenges that they was uh, faced previously and um, i can see lots of nods so i'm guessing others sort of had similar <laughs> experiences and that's an interesting comment from jennifer around actually they've got a gender equality network to reflect for, for all genders which i think is great certainly something to feedback 
Uh, any other comments or questions or, or challenges? So I know Maria said that there was a couple of challenges that you were facing as an organisation. Yeah, for sure. So I am. Um, I've only been in post eight weeks now with Nelft, um, and this is a whole new role following the white paper issued December 2021 around the millions and millions that are being ploughed into the social care sector in terms of transforming adult social care. So they're my top level objectives. I think, you know, I, I've been working in uh, as a wellbeing lead for about five years now at Havering and Newham, and now I've moved on to uh, my first NHS role, which I feel very privileged to be part of. Um, for me, the challenge has been every single step of my way is engagement, comms and engagement, especially when we look at local authority, the gardeners, the street care. I mean, I've been known to be delivering men's health webinars in the crematorium in the chapel. And, you know, it really is getting out there and thinking a bit creatively. I think my challenge now, I'm working with care homes. Now, they're independent, they're not NHS workers, but my remit is to work with them. So I'm working with private organisations with public money, if you like. Yeah, because that's coming down from central government. Also, I'm working with GP practices, primary care networks. Um, I'm going to be working with dentists, optometrists and that sort of thing. So bringing that into this, you can see from my background where the Keeping Well Now, which is Keeping Well North East London hub. And we offer almost um, the foundation of the hub is really a almost similar to an employee assistance program where we have, we have a team of chat ambassadors where people call in. So opening that up to this other sector. But again, my challenge, you know, care homes. Yeah, remotely, timing. I always think about my client, my customer, that 82% women work in the care sector. Um, and a huge majority are over the age of 50, average age is 41. So you're looking at a big menopause time bomb there as well. So lots and lots of work to do. But again, I'd welcome any views around that challenge around they're not sitting in front of a PC. They're caring, they're, you know, domiciliary care is another one of my areas and I'm willing to do anything, that extra mile, that do anything I can do to get them engaged in attending. I'm just rolling out the menopause programme with Hempict. I'm sure many of you have heard of Hempict. I've worked with them for the last four years. So any tips, tricks, anything we can do I was thinking of a sandwich board you know just wandering around but you know so I welcome any tips tricks thoughts what you've done what worked and how did you measure the engagement again it's that measurement that benchmarking if you went in and did an, an initiative what was you know how did you measure that that did have an impact I mean the biggest thing isn't it they want reduce the sickness absence you know and we all know about the cost per employee for sickness and you know, and people used to say around well-being and how much we're spending on it. And I'm like, well, you try sickness then. Yeah, if you think uh, well-being is expensive, try sickness. So, yeah, so lots of challenges, but exciting ones as well. Really exciting ones. I looked after the care homes at Surrey and well, the care home staffs. And, and so it was a lot of physical posters, um, getting people on site. So where we would would host the odd Teams event, we would usually pay people to go on site um, or encourage staff to, to make visits there. Um, and I think what was really key for us is we had wellbeing champions at the different um, sites just so they could pass on messages, sort of drive the culture change as much as they could. But it was that physical presence um, and just being really flexible with we do sessions at eight o'clock at night on the weekend. So it's just being really flexible around, around the workforce. Um, there were channels of communication and channels and, and we just tried to make things as simple as possible, free phone lines, just anything that made it really easy for them to take part. Um, in terms of measurement, it was just through um, physical paper feedback forms. So it, it went a little bit um, sort of old school where it was physical posters, physical forms, physical presence. 
Um, but it was, yeah, it was, it was quite successful, but it was a very different approach to sort of corporate colleagues and, and those that were on the usual communication channels. Um, but yeah, the, the feedback was really, really positive. But we looked at get just taking the people to them rather than expecting them to sort of make all the moves and make all the effort. That's a little bit what we did. Thank you. Thank you. All makes complete sense. Um, but Patrick. Yeah, Maria, yeah, interesting what you're saying about communication, about that being key. So just one, maybe a thought thought here and, and about measurement, how, how the, uh, we, we feel that at the top they're saying, you did that, what was the difference? You did that thing, what was the difference? Yet in our own lives, would we, would we say, what is it about our house that we like, for example? Oh, it's the colour of the walls, it's that one thing. It's a whole bunch of things, some of them that are tangible, some of them that, that are intangible. And maybe that's something as a group we need to spend a lot of that communication working on. That's say, saying that just because we, you know, this isn't the only thing. There's lots of stuff and it's about the, the overall feeling. I haven't got an answer to this. I mean, our employee survey, to, uh, we use something where it talks about the, the balance of the deal, whether employees feel they're getting a good deal and it's beyond well-being, lots of different aspects. But that idea, generally, you know, how do you think the deal is working here from a, you know, for your well-being, rather than focusing on, we did this health check, what do you say, we did this campaign, has that improved your well-being? Because I think we, you sort of get onto a hiding of um, a bit like the NHS measuring uh, how many people have had their first appointment uh, about a cancer diagnosis within five weeks or whatever it was, and uh, you start going, well, doctoring the, <laughs> doctoring what that count. What do you mean by you? Do you know what I mean? You you get into definitions and lose sight of what we're really trying to do, which is improve that well-being of employees. Um, within the workplace. Mm. Oh, can I come back on that? Is that all right? Can I thank Patrick? Thank you so much. I think uh, because this particular sector is a whole new thing for them because they haven't had this in the past, if you like, they have had elements of it. Not, It's not brand new, but actually all of a sudden, you know, there we were on a Thursday evening clapping for NHS workers. And what, what the evidence is suggesting that these workers feel a bit abandoned and feel a bit left out because, you know, a lot of people believe actually they work for the NHS, but they don't. They work for independent <laughs> organisations. Yeah. So it is a new thing for them and almost there sometimes I'm getting a little bit of like suspicion or cautiousness why are you giving us this money we've just done this well-being accelerator fund where they could bid for five thousand pounds um uh, this is a care home and GP practices so some of them are setting up you know um calm rooms for staff ordering exercise bikes they're loving it they think it's Christmas you know and it's and it's working really well but I think it's it's a bit of a new beginning for this sector to get this amount of attention and funding for the well-being of their people. Thank you, Maria. And then we've got uh, Tina, which it's been such a great discussion. I wish we had kept the extra half an hour now, but uh, Tina will probably have to be our last one. So, Tina, go. Thank you. Now, I was just going to um, pick up on some of the points that you've been discussing, and particularly I think Joe's put a comment in around um you know those frontline um staff and it's just that sort of um that con uh, that conversation around comms and engagement and i guess our challenge is that what we're trying to avoid is having this two-tier workforce where you've got the front line the heart to reach um staff members it's particularly from a well-being perspective and obviously we've got lovely fancy internet pages and all the information that goes out you know uh, via sort of ECOP you know uh, electronic um, communications um, but we do have um, a few departments actually trialing out an app at the moment so um, an app that's available on um, personal devices or work phones like for example for road workers and what that does is that well I don't know technical side so not really involved in that pilot but what that does is it pushes messages directly to that mem staff member's phone so obviously we've got leads within the departments um that will you know managers whatever will push out messages you know through um posters etc you know in in, the, in sort of the uh, i guess the depots and things but this app 
if we're running initiatives, etc., it just gets that direct communication out to those individuals where I think these individuals do need wellbeing support if you ask them. But actually, um, one, there's that comms element of it. You know, is it getting to them on time? Um, and then that I think for me, that challenge is how do we get these people involved? You know, it's that conversation with the managers to say you need to somehow work, allow these members of staff you know, work out some sort of rota, et cetera, to be able to attend these sessions. Because actually, I bet a lot of, you know, social workers, road workers, just as an example, want to come along to these sessions, but because of the the, the sort of the nature of their work, maybe they don't. So there's a lot, sorry, I've covered a lot. So there's comms, there's that, that, that challenge, there's a challenge of sort of, um, you know, being able to actually physically attend. And then there's this app that I've just sort of really briefly update, updated you on that's something that we're trialling at the moment. So it just gets that direct messages across to um, the employee's phone. But yeah. Lovely. So, Thank you, Tina. And I do a lot of what we're discussing. It's interesting. We worked with a provider around looking at developing an app and they said a lot of councils, what they actually mean is they're talking about the communications. And it is and yeah. from that discussion. It's kind of it's hard to get those comms out to you know those areas where they're not on the internet they're not constantly looking at them yeah, and we're on the mm. i'm not saying managers aren't doing it but it's mm. you are it's that consistency yes yeah, some managers exactly. will do it, other managers necessarily mm. won't but obviously what we want to do is make sure that everybody gets those messages out and um, we're developing a you know a lead um, a well-being offer then everybody should have access to it so yeah, yeah. exactly and, and that's where kind of wellbeing champions, as others have mentioned, can be really helpful. I'm, I'm conscious that, that we've run over and I think maybe next time we need to think about keeping the extra half an hour for the session so we can keep this conversation going. Um, but just to finish off, just to say a huge thank you to Nadal for the session. I think it's really useful to hear about the frameworks, uh, but also then obviously the discussion that's come from that. Um, for everyone else, obviously, thank you for your attendance. Thank you for your engagement. Uh, it'd be really great if people can put comments in the chat or obviously email the Let's Improve workplace uh, email address if there are things that you think would be useful for future sessions equally if you'd like to come and present yourselves about something in particular or share a challenge etc uh, it'd be great to hear from you all uh, but just a huge huge thank you uh, I know we've got Niz in the background so thank you to Niz as well uh, and yeah we all hope you have a lovely rest of the day but let's keep this conversation going so not just here but for our other communication channels as well so thank you all thanks for sorting Sabrina thank you thank you have you got the date for the next session, Sabrina? It has yes, out. it'll be the 14th of July, I believe. Uh, so that will be the same time on the 14th of July. Amazing. Thank you. Uh, but we'll send email details out. Thanks all. Okay, thanks. Bye, everyone.